Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining, and thank you for being patient with us. Um, we are going to start shortly, or we are about to start now. Um, I do would like to um, officially welcome you to this session on data protection, um, especially um, on the role of data agencies and what um, the policy regulations around that. And we are <coughs> sorry, um, also holding that from the youth perspective. And so um, we do hope um, for a lot of inputs and um, a lot of contributions in those areas. We try as much as possible to make it engaging. And um, of course, the speakers who would make submissions shortly, but we want a global input from um, the audiences here. And we, we all know really that the, the issue of um, data protection is high. Um, we've recorded a lot of um, data surveillance issues happening. And so um, I must say that this um, topic is, is handy. And um, seeing it from the youth perspective is also one of the great things to have. Now um, we are we have two such, um, we have two speakers sorry joining online and we have three wonderful speakers here um i'm just going to let them introduce themselves shortly and then we'll move on to that so um i'm just going to start right by my side um give the microphone to kyla to introduce herself Thank you so much. My name is Carla. I am an environmental and sanitary engineer. I am also a co-founder and the director of sustainability and projects in Amazonian Youth Cooperation for Sustainable Development. Also, I am a youth ambassador by the UN. And uh, this is me. <laughs> so I pass to Shelby to present herself. Hi, I greet everyone here and welcome to the section. My name is Selby Abraham, popularly known as Fifi Mensa Selby. I'm a digital analyst, IT profession for 10 years. I do um, love volunteering. I do love privacy policy. I've worked with Ghana Data Protection Commission for a year. I do data protection awareness. I do data protection in past assessment. I help organization in privacy issue. I'm also a media speaker on data privacy and digital awareness. I am under IS3C, under Dynamic Collection, under the IGF. I am also a volunteer for EGICFA, Internet Governance Fellow from Africa Internet Governance School on Internet Governance, India School on Internet Governance, Virtual School on Internet Governance, Ghana School on Internet Governance, and finally West African School on Internet Governance. And there is more yet to achieve. Nice meeting you here, and I'm happy to be a speaker for this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I guess that you had um, an embodiment of internet governance, because as you keep mentioning, like you said, yeah, 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 and all that. Um, before Daniel comes in, I would just want to uh, move quickly to those joining via Zoom. If you can hear me, um, I would quickly move to Manu to introduce herself, and um, Shida is also online to introduce themselves shortly. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Manu. If um, Shida is online, I would want you to quickly introduce yourself as well. Yes, yes, I am online. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi. I am currently joining from a rural village in, in India, and I'm trying to move to a location where there is a better connectivity so I can turn my video on. I thought this place would have it, but it doesn't. And this is one of the issues that we might discuss today regarding access for youth community members. 
I am uh, Shraddha. I'm from India, and uh, my core area of work entails policy and research. And I have been uh, an Internet Society uh, Youth Ambassador in the year 2020. And after that, I have been associated in one form or the other with the Internet Society and Internet Governance, either as a volunteer or as a mentor or uh, in one form or the other. Currently, I am the head of, I'm in the board member of the Youth Special Interest Group of ISOC. So if any of you after the session are interested to take the conversation forward, the Youth Special Interest Group uh, would be very, very delighted to have you and it would be fantastic if you could join us. So the Youth Special Interest Board tries to look at policies and we try to understand where the governments are coming from. We're working on multiple governments, some of them in Africa, some of them in other countries across the globe. We will discuss that. I also am uh, the uh, Generation Connect Youth Envoy for the Asia-Pacific region. So the International Telecommunications Union selects youth envoys. So for the Asia Pacific region, I'm a youth envoy. So if anyone of you here, I know that a lot of youth envoys are attending the IGF. So if any of you are here and would love to continue the conversation on the youth special interest group, you're more than happy to join. we will be delighted to have you. And I'm so, so excited to be here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I do understand that we have about four minutes each to opine our thoughts on the subject today, so I'll make mine succinct. I am Daniel Bill Opio from Kampala, Uganda. I'm a lawyer, a data rights specialist, and a cybersecurity enthusiast, also a co-founder of a cybersecurity firm. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. So um, those are our speakers. Now quickly moving into today's session, we try to um, make break the session into three different areas. Um, we'll be looking at policy, we'll be looking at um, agency, and we'll be looking at um, data protection itself. So now behind the, the backbone of the issue discussed, in terms of the authorities, we are really looking at how data protection agencies ensure that all personal data are kept safe. Um, now when you, you, you submit an information online, right, or you fill a form online, what happens to that data after? Now again, for those who, who register physically, what happens to the paper or whatever the registration form is after that? So we are going to base the conversation onto that um, space. Now, in terms of um, stakeholders as well, I'm sure that we all here belong to one stakeholder group or, or the other. What kind of awareness are we creating um, for individuals in our various institutions or um, our various stakeholder group, right? And um, in terms of data controllers, right? How do we actually process the data? So this is just um, a basis of how we are going to discuss. So moving quickly, again, I'm going to start with Carla probably because you're sitting next to me. I would want you to, um, um, I mean, pinpoint some of the challenges that we usually face when it comes to data protection. Because really, this is not a new topic, right? And we keep doing that, um, discussing this all the time. What are some of the challenges we face when we talk about data protection in terms of agencies? What are some of the challenges you could explain on that? Then um, we have, um, maybe if you could project that, we um, have a special um, application called Menti where you could submit your comment or question if you don't want to be identified. Just and then most will read it out, answer that for you. So um, we would project that. You could do that as side was the contribution happens. So you could. Thanks, Fyodor, for the question. Um, hi, everyone, again. My name is Carla Giovanna, and I come from the state of Pará. That uh, is a station of continental dimension located in the Amazon region. And uh, in the state of Pará, we have uh, big problems, as it is decided. And uh, uh, within the various challenges we have uh, in the Amazon region, to achieve the sustainable development goal. I will briefly talk about the one very horrorsome vulnerability that we, uh, environmental and human rights activists, have in the survive in one of the states that most kill environmental activists in Brazil. 
in this context in which we, Amazonia, carry the struggle for our territory as a legacy, unfortunately, areas are constant, as well as the deprivation of our rights among them, access to a quality and contextualized education that understands that data privacy and protection are essential for our survival, especially after COVID-19, uh, something we often need to migrate from our territory, city, and even country to the leakage of personal information about your location that may endanger us in a context of access to connectivity or not. This happened because our territory is very environmentally rich and that are related to economic guidelines that exploit our land and our body to export our riches while we socialize our misery. While your forest, our land, our water, our life is living. Because Amazonia don't exist without us. The Amazonia does people standing. So how can we raise awareness among the most vulnerable population who have not had access to contextualized education on data privacy and protection, and agents that can receive this type of complaint? in a context where violence is equipped by institutional structures, making it, make it difficult not only to report, but also effective in protecting activists and other endangered populations. This was a concern that we, from the Amazonian Youth Cooperation for Sustainable Development, or just Cojoven, had especially during the 2022 elections and during the period of Bolsonaro violent government, where he had several data on health, education, deforestation, erased or leaked. Having been a genocidal government for the Amazonian people in front of a struggle, building a context of violence that reinforced the non guarantee and the non sex to our right. And we from Conjoven understood that the way out to build an education training program based on the pillars of fundamental rights, territorial development, media literacy, and digital security for activists aiming at a contextualized education using peer methodology. Or and was to guarantee the exercise of citizenship of this youth by taking security measures that ranged from avoiding sharing their location in real time or not, to the formation of a support network for young activists from the state of Pará. The network enables to us to echo and carry out our denouncements. It's not at the state level, but at the international level, the main change in the systems that sentence us to death. Sadly, we still have a lot of change to face in the Amazonian territory, especially within communities who live in the environmentally rich territories, because the most of the case of activism that happens in this place. Often, digital exclusion is another challenge for us to communicate to our network about what has happened before the wars happen. In conclude by saying that it is urgent to have training programs that are contextualized and sensitive to Amazon realities on data privacy and protection. So that I or any other Amazonian on the front of line of the struggle don't have our life cut off like Bruno Pereira, Dom Felipe, José Cláudio Pereira, Maria do Espírito Santo, Ari Uruel Wauau, Dorothy Steng, Chico Mend, and all those who died in defense of our territory. Data protection and privacy does not protect only the virtual world. It protects the actual lives of engaged people who materialize our dreams in a life of a fight for human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
that that was an extensive submission, right? That usually when we are talking about data protection, we don't really look at people that has lost their lives just because of how exposed um, their data were on the internet, right? I'll pose the same question to Fifi, but at this time around, um, I would want to find out what are some of the challenges that the youth, the younger people are facing when it comes to data protection? And I mean, of course, you could talk about West Africa. Yes. Thank you very much, Tiros. And thank you very much, my other speakers, Kara, and other speakers for elaborating on this section. Um, let's see, data protection, why is it important? We are human. Data is now an evolving goal in this era. We use data to do analysis in business. We use data to make decisions and to make provisions for people. With this 17th IGF, data has been a key role that has helped us to mobilize the section, arrange the rooms, everything. So data is very important. But when we are taking data, what is the privacy behind it? That is the most important thing we have to know. Now let's go back to the roots in my, in my region, West Africa. People were taught how to learn English mathematics, so they know how to use the formulas very well. There is a serious gap within that. If you are able to address the gap, then meaning that data protection must be a literacy course for basic foundation in schools, whereby people, youth, will understand the concept of protecting the privacy. They must, one, understand the concept of their privacy. They must also understand the context of the authorities who are into it. In most African countries have not passed the data protection law as compared to the GDPR and Europe and America and other stuff, and which has been a very serious gap when it comes to Africa. Now, I'm looking at in the perspective of the technical community. We have people, young people, developing applications, websites from schools, universities. Do we train them about the privacy aspect of development? Do we train them about the privacy aspect of data that they are taking in their various applications. We have to also include the academia when we mean data protection. It's a very important because the academia trained the technical community to come up and we need to address that. Now, Tiaros, let me take the last section of this to address. In Africa, what we like is that we don't have a common data protection regulation which has been passed out by the, as the GDPR also works. So there is a lack. Most youth don't seem to see that there is an opportunity in it because unlike the European and other Western countries, whenever you do anything related to data, there is regulations. And we must adhere to it that we must take responsibility as an African union to equip the youth in terms of resources and other stuff. The last part will be Academia. Why academia? We have school on internet governance is fine. They are doing their part. But what we want to ensure is that the academia board, the accreditation board should bring out a privacy protection courses in our universities, degrees and other stuff, which will equip people to pursue courses like computer science that is done. People will do data governance, data privacy. So these people can really come out also as an expert group and we will be able to achieve this privacy awareness we are creating. This will help us to also close the gap in Africa and we can have a supportive section with other countries. Thank you very much. Hello? Great, this works. So in, in the same line with um, just your last submission, I would want to move online to Manu to talk um, about language that is used. Um, now, when you read most um, agreements, right, for example, if you're going to open a social media platform, there's always this, do you agree, do you, and, and all that. Now, how many of you really understand what those things are? Do you really understand? Now, you know that when you're going to open a Facebook page without saying, I agree, you don't have a Facebook account, right? and you want to be on Facebook. So what do you do usually? I don't want to talk to everyone, but I will just click I agree because I really need to be 
on that platform. So I'm moving that to Manu, and there's um, a great comment on Menti from um, someone um, who wanted to know um, how the, the language in terms of privacy agreement is made simple, and the person is specifically um, want you to give an explanation on the issue of um, Trinidad and Tobacco and all those issues that come around that. So if you can hear me, you could take your flow on that. Thank you. Just to understand, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Great. Thank you for the comments on Menti. We have here someone from Trinidad and Tobago who said that language is very difficult to understand, just like Hiro said. And we have also someone saying that there's an issue for under understanding where not everyone fully understands how big tech companies share or store their data. So let's talk a little bit about this. I have two main points that I think are important. One, I think I will complement Carla's speech about the importance of contextualized education, especially in surfing that we believe in peer-to-peer -peer education as an awareness strategy. But I will also complement that only education is not enough. We have to have a compromise because uh, we can't depend on the burden for the individual to be the only person responsible for the exercise of something that is a fundamental right, which is data privacy and data protection. We can't just burden the individual so that they have to take all the control of their accounts, their checklists, their information, and this is their problem and this is their responsibility, and so be it. We need to have like a compromise and we need to have uh, terms that really guarantee effective transparency and not just something that you click like you agree because you want to participate. So for my first, first point, the importance of peer-to-peer -peer education. Uh, recent research shows that not only youth, but especially children and adolescents, when they have a problem on the internet, they learn from each other. So why privacy and data protection education is so important and why does it affect our lives? Well, SaferNet has a child helpline where we aid child with issues, you know, regarding data protection, regarding human rights violations on the internet, and we see data patterns of a raise in demands of account violations, hacking, less of control, lack of control of personal data, including images. This is really important because when we see this data pattern, we see that this latest Brazil had some big, big data breaches in the last few years where we had compromised passwords and accounts. And this is exploited on this online environment that, that we have. And this creates his, this create really, really big harms for instance, an email recently circulated in Brazil, reaching and saying that they had their photos stolen and that they should pay some kind of money so they wouldn't um, they wouldn't disclosure nudity photographs. This is really important because when we are talking about data protection, we are talking about the control of our flow of information. So to enhance awareness, we need to have strategies for this. Uh, one thing that we like to use is humor, is engagement, is games, is to facilitate the language so we can allow for people to understand. And more than that, we also like to allow child participation to understand how child feel about this, how youth feels about this, and allow them to have the tools to create their own projects for awareness. Now, my second topic, how the burden can't be on individuals for all of this that I said. Today, when we go to set our privacy accounts, we have like checklists, we have apps to download, and we don't understand which one is safe or not. We have difficult languages, or we have like these really big terms saying that this and that, and we really don't understand how this works. And we have something that is very specific in the global South, that some terms of use, they are more protected for European citizens than global South countries. So even though Brazil has a regulation, we had a recent case about this, where there was no such transparency for us, even though we have a regulation, and European countries were more protected in a transparency issue. So this is a really important thing. How will affect us in this perceived um, privacy and data protection regulation? Because of this, we have a few needs. We need to enhance the debate about privacy by default and by design. What does that mean? Data protection is a human right. This is protected here in Brazil. And it is non-negotiable. I shouldn't have to change all my settings. I shouldn't have this burden to change all my settings. Because this is a human right. I should be protected by default and by pattern. And this is a compromise that we have to take with developers, with applications, with private companies that they are providing this service that almost uh, that it complies with a public function that allows us to speak, to communicate, to connect. We need to give more actual control and actual tra transparency, like understand exactly what is happening in a friendly language. And we need to have control of our settings. And more than that, how can we engage more youth 
debate. We should be part of the design of tech, of the decisions about tech. We need to think about enhancing civic participation of these decisions, because if, technolo if technologies are affecting our lives now, they will affect more lives of youth in the future. So we really need to think, I think, about youth councils, consultations and research that consider context, that consider difference in access. And we have to have a perception, I think, of a critical education. And not only that, as Global South, I really believe that we can build new ways to think about technology. How are we building our technology? Do we have to, do we really need to have like this feedback loop where we think that the platforms that we have, that the apps that we have, they are everything now? Or can we build something new? Can we have new examples? Can we have new applications? And what is the paper of each stakeholder for that? So those are a few considerations that I would like to, to give. Thank you. Hello. Yes, so um, back to the room, I would quickly want to move to Daniel. Um, now we have, um, again, issues of infrastructure and um, infrastructure in terms of data privacy education. There are a lot of challenges in that. I think that AB has threw some light on that, but could you give us a more youth perspective on that, especially in the Global South? What are some of the challenges that we face in terms of data privacy education, um, I mean, in those areas? Okay, thank you so much, Theoros and the preceding panelists. I would first love to say that about a, a one, a one third of the internet users population in the world is below the age of 18. So when we are looking about uh, talking about the challenges that um, young people face, especially in relation to education on uh, some of the data privacy challenges, we'd have to look at uh, users who are probably haven't yet developed that kind of maturity and judgment to appreciate what goes on online. Some of the challenges such as uh, cyberbullying, then um, surveillance, normalization, because if you are groomed from a particular age, let's say you have access to internet from the age of 10, with time you get to accept certain elements that take place which affect your privacy without notice because there's some form of surveillance capitalism that takes place as a result of, you know, as you mentioned, some of the, the, the terms and conditions that you need to accept to be able to access a platform. And some of these young children who have access to the internet do not know some of those terms, don't understand them. And in the global south, I mean, some of these laws are so new. For example, in my country, in Uganda, where I come from, the Data Protection and Privacy Act is of 2019. So even if we're not looking at the young people and we are looking at those that are older, they also don't understand properly the element of data protection and privacy. So how will the young ones be able to, to understand that? I, I believe the, the, the first element of... Um, the element of education should, the burden of education actually, in my opinion, should be with the developers of some of the platforms that draw the attention of, of the young people. Uh, Emmanuel has mentioned something about privacy by design, but I think the awareness can take place on some of those platforms. If a young child is going to join a, a particular platform, there must be consent from an adult to help educate them on where they should go, what are the boundaries of, of what they are doing to avoid them coming across uh, elements such as inappropriate you know, age content. Uh, some children get addicted to pornography simply because they did not know what to indulge with and what not to indulge with. So I think the element of, of education and literacy governments actually have to you know, put a lot of effort and probably start with uh, primary education, secondary education, even at universities have some form of training that takes place to let uh, young people know how to conduct themselves online. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, I would move on to our last submissions and then we would open the floor for questions and inputs and contributions. Now I'm moving straight forward to Shida with online. Um, and I would just want to pose the questions, um, right? So want to know what are some of the opportunities um, um, that are open for youth um, to flaunt the, the agenda of data protection in their, um, in, in their areas or stakeholder group. Shida, if you can hear me. Yes, thank you so much, Theoros. I hope you can hear me too. Yes, we can. 
Okay, amazing. That's a very important and a very relevant question for the youth community of our age and the problems and the important insights that the speakers, Manuela, Danielle, everyone, all of them have highlighted are very relevant. So the few opportunities that I would like to discuss are the opportunities in the field of policy policy decisions and policy making that the youth can and should influence because right now what we are seeing is a trend of very old people deciding the future of very young people so there is an intergenerational disconnect which we need to make sure is turning into a dialogue between intergenerations and they're taking our insights how do we do that there are ways you can indulge that at your local level so the everything every grassroots movement starts from your own backyard and the starting of each and every such moment should happen within your local levels. Try to see what the policies are within your governments. So usually what the uh, global south is seeing a trend in terms of more and more regulation in the past years. What we are seeing is that since 2019, the governments in the global south are moving more towards regulation and less towards uh, online autonomy which is slightly problematic and the way we can influence that is to keep a very keen eye and be aware of what rules and regulations your governments are bringing in and how they will potentially impact your freedom and your expression your privacy in the cyberspace because privacy is a human right and a fundamental right in almost all the global south countries while they do give lip service to the idea they also do not consider it to the utmost extent where they actually implement it at a national level. So we need to make sure that the governments are bringing in and implementing these policies at the national level. We also need to take into consideration how we can influence and indulge in these policies. And one of the things in that is by focusing more towards the idea of youth participation. So what we're seeing is a governmental trend in taking youth views into account. And youth community views are taken into account through feedback mechanisms, through indulgences, where the governments are trying to make sure that the youth community is participating. And they take our reference to youth voices. So organizations such as Net Mission. Can you hear me? There was a slight disconnection. So organizations Asia is trying to give voices to youth community in Asia. The youth special interest group is trying to do policy analysis. The youth chosen a year and I'm sure this year are doing some brilliant work. So all of these are activities and avenues where you can indulge. Try to connect with all these people. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we'll open floors for questions. So, any question? Yes, thank you. Uh, questions, input? Hi. Um, firstly, um, thank you very much uh, for the amazing panel. Um, so uh, my question is about what you think the tech companies should do when it comes to such matters, because what we see is that politicians um, politicians are quite slow when it comes to catching up with technology. Um, they don't sometimes really understand the mechanism that work behind. And um, I come from Turkey's intern to observatory. And what we do in our work is that we try to kind of show that actually the changes about privacy and child safety, they can all happen through product changes. So just even if we think about um, the terms and conditions, they're so small, right? It could be different. So I, I'm really curious about your opinion about what you think the big tech should do and how we can hold them accountable in these matters. Thank you so much again. Um, so sh he, she, okay, do you want to? Oh, okay. So we can take two and then we would answer that. Okay. Hi, I have kind of like three questions. So my first question is, is there an African youth institution or something, just an institution that's formed to create, since this is a youth policy focused conversation, 
that focuses on creating policies from the ground up rather than adopting policies based on the global state that's solely focused on building policies for the, from the ground up. And then two, on the implementation aspect, since it's a, it's a, um, what's it called? Uh, something which comes up in all these conversations that you have uh, about policies, because we can come up with good policies and all that, but at the end of the day, it's the implementation which matters. So is also that an institution which is focused on policy auditing a youth one, considering, like I said, the perspective that we are focusing this on, that's solely focused on auditing policies. And then my last question um, is, sorry, you have to answer and then I'll, I'll say it again, because it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Okay, so, two questions. okay. Um, yeah. um, yes, we'll take the last one. We have a hand raised up online as well. Um, okay, so we'll take it in badges so that um, the speakers would not really forget the questions, right, after so after you, and then we move on. Okay, okay. So good afternoon. Congrats for this relevant panel, really relevant. I'm Maria, and I am here representing Alana Institute, which is a non-profit Brazilian civil society organization whose mission is to honor children. Uh, part of our work is related to the digital rights of the children and adolescents, uh, especially related to commercial exploitation of their vulnerabilities. I'd like to hear from you a little bit more on this relation between uh, the data privacy and practices like targeted advertisement and so on, uh, especially on the Global South. We are specific here. So uh, to, to children, especially, who are especially vulnerable, so what are uh, for you the roles of each part of, of this digital ecosystem in this issue? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over the three questions shortly and then I'll throw it to our speakers, any of them that are ready. If I quite remember, the first one is on the role of um, big tech companies, what exactly they are going to do in terms of data protection, how they can um, keep the data safe, right, and how they can educate more people on that, right? Then the second one is on the data protection policy, right? If I get it, yeah. Okay, can you help me? Yeah. Data protection policy. No, I want to know if an institution or like, like an agency. Okay. Okay. And then the, the third one is on um, targeted ads for, for children and data protection load. So I'm going to throw the first one to Manu online, um, on the one on big data. I'm going to send the second one to AB, and I'll take the third one with Daniel. So um, AB, you will start. Manu, you come after on big data, and then I'll do that. And we take um, the rest of the submissions in the room. All right. Thank you for the question. Data protection regulation. Start with the government. Um, United Nations IGF, as part of our team, they are also preaching about data protection and privacy. It is mandated that each government, each country, must set up a data protection act. In Africa, as of last year, June, based on my analysis report that I check, we have 14 countries who have signed up to data protection act. They are practicing. Let me come down. In Ghana, we have Data Protection Authority. They become a regulator. The regulator ensures that entities, when I say entities, companies, businesses, individuals, who process or collect personal data of any data subject must be able to register with a commission. It doesn't end there. After you have registered with a commission, you have to be compliance. The compliance means that they run audits every two years in Ghana to check the impact assessment. How are you safeguarding your data? Do you share data across border with another country? Do you seek consent before you share people's data? What are the third parties do you share data with? So there's a lot of compliance. If you fail, when you breach, you be fine in the law or the key stakeholders. It doesn't take it just like that. When you are registering for the data protection registration in my country, Ghana, 
you must provide key people. If there is any irregularities or failure to comply with the laws and regulations, the key decision makers will be held accountable. But this is the gap, because we are talking about a gap. Some countries have it. The gap in Africa is that African Union needs to champion one data protection regulation that can cover every country so that we have a state institutions who are going to regulate the company businesses. So if I have a business in Rwanda, in Ethiopia, and in Ghana, we have one cross data protection regulations that can be used to regulate us. And this happens on GDPR. If I'm in um, Belgium, Germany, GDPR is a regulation that covers that. So the gap is that all the government institutions must come together, work together with the United Nations, work together with the African Union and other stakeholders to formulate this process. If you are able to do that, we'll close the gap and the compliance, that is the auditing section, will be effective. Thank you very much. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you so much. So quickly move to Manu to answer the first question, the role of big data shortly. Thank you. I think this question also approach uh, a big challenge that we have that is also artificial intelligence regulation. We are going through this right now in Brazil and in a lot of other countries. And like they said about data protection, this also creates an opportunity for us to think about what are the questions that we want to pose as the global south? Because today we know that companies, they work a lot in a maximized shareholder profit logic. So how can we have policies and how can we have like strong civic engagement to create some kind of pressure and see the community as a stakeholder that allows for, for pressure for us to think a little better about this use, massive use of data. I will be really short in this response because it's a complicated topic. And also we have four hands raised online. So I'd really like for people to contribute. If you are, a if you are asking a question, but you want to answer a question, you are allowed to. So this is just a few considerations. Right, thank you. So um, before we move online, just shortly, I'll let Daniel answer the last um, set of questions in the room on um, data privacy and children and arts. So if we could do that. Okay, thank you. That's quite a tough question. <laughs> so I was hoping if there is someone in the room that has thoughts to share later on, that could also jump in. But behavioral advertising or profiling uh, the nature of exchange of children and young people online is not any different from what happens with those that are above uh, the age of, of young people. Usually, you, you've seen things that have come up on, for example, Facebook for businesses, you know, Instagram business account and, and all that. I think there has to be some form of conversation on, on, on moderation, how, how we can you know, moderate the tech companies, the tech giants, and the businesses that are operating online, such that they do not serve that um, user profile of, of uh, children and young people that engage with their platforms. A case in point, uh, like there is DuckDuckGo, which only uses uh, special, you know, isolated words to enable uh, advertisement to go on online, and they don't profile anyone. They've declined to share that personal information of, of behavioral you know, patterns of, of use of their clients with Facebook. The same thing with New York Times. They also declined to share that kind of uh, information with, uh, with, with Facebook. So I think if we can get more engagement on businesses and these tech giants, I think we can be able to achieve a certain uh, level of success. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's a conversation that needs, uh, you know, more than just. I, I think it's 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 a lot in the hands of the developers of this technology. Just like you, you know, you create YouTube for children, and there has to be authorization from guardians and parents to be able to help them access. I think the element of design comes in a lot to ensure that we help uh, eliminate, you know, behavioral profiling to create targeted. Um, uh, advertisement, which sometimes can be overwhelming and can draw young children to uh, places that uh, they don't want to be. I think I've tried to respond to that. But if there's anyone in, in this room that uh, thinks of a better way in which we can be able to address that issue, I would be very glad to hear your views on that. Thank you. 
Great. So we have um, some hands raised up online. We would want to take that. Um, we are almost running out of time, so I would advise that we keep our questions short and straight to the point. We have four uh, hands online so far, so we could take... Um, um, Manu, you could help us moderate that, take one after the other. Sure. The first one is Bibek. I uh, Sorry if I pronounced wrong, but you can introduce yourself as well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, this is Vivek Silwal, IJF Youth Ambassador from Nepal. So I actually want to make a quick comment in the interest of time. So while looking at the Global South, there are extremely huge number of mobile users than other platforms. And out of those, they are mostly using for social media or some recreational purposes. So when we talk about having strings and regulations for uh, governing the data or company using, I think there are still a lot of risks regarding the small and medium enterprises and startups where they process the data, but they do not have the security compliance. And the government regulations cannot actually overlook at all these aspects. So it comes at the due diligence of the company to look at this thing. So what I want to make the comment is that you should advocate for better practices on both ends. The infrastructure and applications ends where small or startup companies, they should be complying with the policies, the local regulations as part of their due diligence and the other aspect is about the awareness. Yeah, that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we have the second person? The second one here is Chris. Chris, you have the floor. Okay, can I hear you? Yes. I can hear you. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, and I saw uh, IGF in Zambasco. Uh, it's great to see that we have such conversations about uh, this in privacy and it's important. Uh, just a privacy of the condition uh, to where the data is actually based. For example, in European regions, and uh, sometimes these regions do not have a lot of policies actually favor the African or some developing nations. So I would just like to know how do you collect uh, solve some of these kind of uh, challenges where we have been um, those that do not really fit into, for instance, in my own uh, context, the African uh, region. Just like uh, the panelists. Uh, okay. Um, can we take the third one and then we give all to Shida? <coughs> Yeah, this is Nicholas now. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My name is Nicholas. I'm an ISOC ambassador, and congrats, guys, on the excellent panel. So my contribution has to do with the asymmetric treatment by companies on data from the global south. And I have a practical example. In the UK, when you assess Google, you have to consent to their cookies before you accept the platform. I had friends check from Nigeria, Tanzania, Ghana, and know those places that pre-consent form is not there. What it means is that Google cookies automatically get downloaded and you get more data mined from users. So I think it is important that as the Global South, we champion this course to get big tech to treat us similar to how they treat the other countries in terms of data handling. But more importantly, in relation to younger generation too, I think that it is important we educate them on the value of privacy itself. Because I fear that our kid brothers and even sometimes ourselves are so used to being within the social media space that we no longer value what privacy it is. In which case, even education and data protection may not be of any value to them. We have to keep having the need to protect privacy and human agency so that when the education on data protection comes, it becomes meaningful for them to apply it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a hand up in the room. Yes. So thank you again. Uh, in terms of the political um, 
sorry, the advertis uh, advertising profiling of uh, children. I just wanted to add that what um, we believe works quite well are the dimensions that make children and adults vulnerable. For example, their psych psychological tendencies, their sicknesses, their illnesses, and whether should we allow advertising to use those kind of information. Actually, if we really go down into data, categorize it, and really understand what kind of information we are giving consent to, we know that we are giving consent to, and whether that can be weaponized against us, our political profiles, I, I believe that will be quite helpful. So for example, we did some analysis on the political targeting operations in Turkey, and we identified that there were political advertising. And when micro-targeting is used, for example, um, let's say you have a Turkish flag on your profile picture, Facebook knows that this might give some information about your political profile and further gives you ideas about what you can do. So uh, we are giving way more information than we think we are. Um, e even if we just take a look at the fact that the last thing we do is going onto a social media account, the first thing we do in the morning is also that. That gives a lot of information about our sleep patterns. That tells a lot about our depression, about our personal daily lives. So, uh, so when we really understand the depth of the information that lies there, I believe that um, will help people like you. And thank you so much again for the panel to um, really regulate what these companies should be doing and should not be doing. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we are going back online to pick um, um, our last submission online from Lucy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your roles. Thank you, panelists. My name is Lucy Maura. I'm one of the youth ambassadors. Thank you for the conversation. Um, my initiative is connected to this. And my submission is on going to ask on the question of children and how to address um, protection of children. Um, one of the main things that we need to understand is that when it comes to protection of children, a higher threshold should be put, even in which is missing a lot of data protection laws in Africa specifically. And so that is one of the major concerns that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is, do we have any more comments, contributions, questions in the room? Yes, so we take the last one and I'll move to our speakers for the last submission. So if we go to here. Yeah. Hi. I have a question, contribution uh, regarding um, targeting and children online. I, we've, I, I come from Colombia and we've studied not only um, direct ad ad advertisement, but how influencers are not directly advertising. And I think this is a much more complex issue because you cannot understand this under the data protection regulation because it has it yes it does have relationship with data protection but not really because influencers get to the kids through other through other ways they are so uh, i just wanted to add that this is a much more complex issue that definitely deserves more research and uh, we might talk about this further um, thank you so much. And with that said, I'm going to go back to our speakers, each with 30 seconds or one minute to give um, their last remarks, and then we can wrap up on that. So I'll start with AB, just one minute. All right, thank you. Um, before the one minute, I want to say that the, tape, the data protection privacy policy for children and their concerns, um, the age varies from country to country. The GDB how takes like 16 years, then the COPA takes like 13 years. And there is a consent on Article 8 and also some regulations for consent and other stuff. So, and also for information societal services, there is a privacy consent section on that based on GDPR. Now, my final take is that data protection is a key and I will advocate that as far as we have courses people have understand to it we must let it be a programming course which we can train our youth in. what i believe is that that is the only way we can close the gap when the youth able to understand their right and privacy policy protection they will escalate that information below to their parents their people around and right and the youth must also understand that they must know their data protection right why are you taking my data? 
Where are you sending my data? What are you using my data for? These are questions. You should ask why when you are providing your data. And you can also go set your privacy policies in your, all the applications you sign up. Thank you very much. And I'm humbled to be here. Hi everyone, I want to say thank you so much for this panel and I believe that uh, we talk very good about um, how the Global South is really vulnerable when I think in data privacy and uh, we have a lot of the study and to build a community that can integrate us in the way of constructing the internet because sometimes I think that the internet uh, is not made for us, because don't include us in, in the way of uh, this platform uh, and this space is structured. So uh, I think that uh, through the international cooperation, we can create uh, more spaces that can be uh, perceived. Uh, I don't know how to say this, per this word in English. <laughs> But uh, we can create a space that can hold more um, plurality and can hold more people like me, like us, to build a resilient space to can reach the um, sustainable goals of the uh, sustainable goals of the of UN. <laughs> and thank you so much for everyone. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, Carla, you're doing just fine and well. Uh, thank you all for taking your time and for the indulgence. I hope to uh, maybe meet uh, the amazing uh, audience participants that were submitting about behavioral profiling. I would love to connect a bit more. I think we have a lot to talk about, both the two ladies and the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Great. Um, I'll move to Manu and to follow Bashida. I'd like to thank everyone who engaged with us. We wanted a lot of participation and we had it and I'm really happy for it. And I would like to also call you guys, like, let's keep discussing this as you from the Global South. Let's research for the spaces that we have for this. Let's connect after this session. I think this is really important. And I'll close up with a comment by Gene. Uh, he made a few questions. We don't have time, but like he made a, a comment that I think the data protection education gap is only the tip of the iceberg. It is a major economic political issue. I think this is a really important question that we do not forget that there are economical interests that should be taken in consideration for any kind of policy regulation or global South perspective for these issues. So how do we see ourselves in this and how can we, you know, unite our fight to understand ourselves as global South fighting for better conditions and better technology that serves us? Thank you. Thank you, um, Shida. Thank you, thank you so much, Tiros. And I want to end uh, by giving uh, all the youth ambassadors and everyone in the audience, whoever's interested in youth participation, one key insight is to keep the conversation going. The questions that you're asking right now are really important and they can all turn into one hour panel sessions on Try to participate more in such IG spaces, join the youth special interest group, join other youth organizations that are currently working. So for example, in Africa, we have the Marsha project, which is mapping regulatory threat uh, in African countries. We have in Asia, the net mission, which is trying to make sure that the policies etc., are analyzed. We have a youth wing, which exclusively works in this regard. So as youth ambassadors, after your work is, uh, after your uh, year is over, do not think that it's an end, it's only the beginning. Continue working in this field. Reach out to the previous youth ambassadors. Some of them are doing exceptional work in the field of policy and in the field of making sure that our world becomes a better and that the data privacy is protected in their respective countries. So we need to make sure that the Global South works hard and manages to do well in this regard. For that, we need your participation, your support, and most importantly, your interest and passion to make sure that you leave the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess we would have to end here, but just a quick summary of what we've discussed. Um, the session was basically on de um, data protection, the perspective of the youth from the global south. Um, we had conversations around big tech companies and their role in data protection. We um, spoke on legislation. We spoke on um, education, um, more understanding. We spoke on um, 
targeted at for kids and their understanding and all that. And we must say that this conversation has not ended here. Let's continue with um, the conversation in our spaces. And for those of us here or online that have a greater role to play in making policies work or making policy inputs, either you belong to the civil society government or anywhere, do your little work in your kana. We are so grateful that you're here. Thank you for spending your time here. My name is Theo Rose, and do have a nice day, afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you, everybody. It was amazing.